Good morning, brothers and sisters. So today we read chapter twenty of First Samuel. So there are, there are lots of mixed feeling in this chapter. I still remember that by the time that I left my seminary. So I went to a church to preach one Sunday. Actually, on that day, I preached on this passage. So actually, at that time, I was experiencing a lot of a separation. I was experiencing a very big life turning point. But what could really help me and sustain me to move on? And that is uh, uh, the emotion and the feeling of a uh, Jonathan. When we are in the hardship, when we are in the storm, I would like all of you to think about this. Do you know who's the who's your friend? Do you know who are your friends? Do you know who will be the one to brave all the storm with you? So if we can have friends, then we can still move on. And this is the one of the greatest blessings that God gave gave us. So if we really have the ones who can truly love us, and especially when we have someone, when we are in the hardship, he or she can still love us and embrace us. So I tell you, it is very rare. I'm not saying that there will not be any. Today, when we are not in the storm, when everything is very smooth sailing in our lives, may we ask God for the strength uh, to really to work on this kind of friendship, even the friendship of covenant, that we can strengthen one another so that we can brave the storm together. So may God bless his words this morning. That is chapter 20 of 1 Samuel. The topic is the stone of the departure and the feeling of confidence. So do you know that in the Bible, in the scripture, it talks about a piece of rock, a piece of stone. And to Jonathan and David, it, this piece, this stone is a very familiar for them. In verse 19, and verse 19, and when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the dead and remain by the stone easel. Whenever David got any troubles, he would be hide himself there. So that's the hiding place of David. Or you may be able to put it, another word is sanctuary. So it is just like a sanctuary for David. It seems that when you run into the sanctuary, you are under the protection. So, and remain by the stone easel. So in the English translation, uh, it say that. So in certain English translation, it just uh, simply say that that is behind the stone. But yet, in our um, Chinese translation, we put the name of this rock, call this name, call the stone. Easel as a proper noun. What does it mean by easel? Actually, easel means a piece of stone, and the root meaning is the root meaning is farewell, farewell. So I should say the topic is the stone of farewell and the feeling of covenant. So when we walk past all these stones, we just only take them as the ordinary stones. But to Jonathan and David. This is the old place. This is the old place for them. This is the old place that we usually met. 
that's the old place that they usually met. And at the same time, that's also the place that they farewell, they bid farewell to each other. So since from that place that they departed, so that is the place of departure of farewell. So because of that experience and that this, this piece of stone is very uh, memorable to them. Because since then, David needed to run for their lives. Well, in the past, somehow he was only ducking from, uh, from, uh, from King Saul. So all the times he could run away from all these problems. But this time, David needed to be like, a, like an outlaw or maybe needed to be like a fugitive on the run. Outlaw or an fugitive, a fugitive on the run. A fugitive on the, on the run. A fugitive on the run. So since then, when uh, David left this place of farewell, he started to, to become a fugitive. So that's why today I deliberately put this stone in so as the, as the topic. So from chapter 16 to chapter 19, since uh, David was anointed, so his life had been going through a lot of troubles and difficulties. Have you ever thought that when you are anointed by God as a king, and but you are not, but it's not the time for you to succeed to the throne. So before you succeed to the throne and you have been uh, running uh, from you've been running from the difficulties. Would you throw your temper to the Lord? Would you say to God, God, how come you allow me to end up in this situation since you anointed me to be the king? So actually, there is the field between Saul and David. That is about the field between Saul and David. David was never jealous of Saul. And David never imagined that he could snatch the throne away from Saul. So you can see that jealousy was the key things here. So because of the jealousy, so King Saul couldn't feel at ease. But for the one who, who, who was being jealous of, he didn't know anything. He didn't have any intention to hurt anyone. But yet you could see that King Saul was getting much more worried and very restless and very insecure. Because he always assumed David as his enemy, as his opponent. So King, uh, King Saul was the only one to have this kind of mentality. But not even for Jonathan. Because Jonathan never thought that uh, David would come and to snatch away the throne from him. And what about Mika? And actually, Mika, the princess, uh, the daughter of King Saul, also loved David. So everyone in this country, even the Israelites' army, every one of them loved David. David. So you can see that it is very, uh, it is uh, very innocent for for David to be jealous of. So the women even sang the song, right? So David's, uh, David has lent 10,000, but Saul only of thousands. So do you think that that is uh, David's intention to irrigate, uh, to, to upset uh, King Saul? 
for David to upset King Saul? No, he didn't have this kind of a mentality. But but basically, King Saul had lots of worries. He was filled with jealousy. He was filled with lots of worries. So today, in this passage, we could see that King Saul was like this again. For example, they would like to throw the feast. And then the scripture said that, especially in verse 25, how did they, now the king sat on his seat as at other times. So do you see that he was sitting by the wall, on a seat by the wall? So, you know, he was deliberately sitting by the wall so that there would be not anyone behind him, so that no people would be amb ambushed, would be ambushing. He will, so you could see that at the king Saul was very worried, and even deliberately he sat by the wall. He was always disturbed by the distressing spirit. That, that this distressing spirit, I would say, that is the spirit of jealousy. He got a lot of bitterness, a lot of hatred, a lot of anger. So that's why he grit his teeth. So he he was very determined to kill David. So that's why David's, David's life was very difficult since then. Well, it is not God's, it is not uh, David's intention to do all these things to stir up the anger of a King Saul. So, brothers and sisters, I'm not sure whether you also have this kind of distressing spirit of jealousy within you. You know, for some people, they are the they are the eye of soul. They are the soul. They are the soul of the eye. Some people, you will take them as the soul of the eye. So whenever you have time, then you will you will think about him. So we have to ask God to take away this uh, this uh, spirit of jealousy, so that we will not easily take anyone to be your opponents. So you have to understand that in all relationship, God is there. God is watching over. David, even though King Saul was not kind to David, but for King, but for David, this was the process of his growth. That was the process of his ascension to the throne. Because why? Right throughout this journey, he would learn a lot of important life lessons, and all these lessons would be very helpful, very beneficial to molding the lives of David, so that David could understand more of God in all the crises. In all the crises, he could see how God was important to him, because he knew that he could not depend on his own strength, and instead he needed to depend on God totally. So David also realized that he was not in a good situation. But at the same time, he did not know how this situation would last for, how long it would last for. So the scripture is very exciting. So actually, the scriptures haven't mentioned how long King Saul had been running after, King, uh, uh, after David. Don't know, he didn't know how long he needed to run for his life. But yet he believed God. So in all these uh, twists and turns, he knew that God prepared for him. And above all, he didn't have any grumbling against God. He knows that he's only experiencing the life in this way, uh, uh, but without any grumbling. So today, we take a look at Jonathan. So we can see there's a special friendship between Jonathan and David. So how his friendship strengthened David. You have to know that David was, was not a simple fugitive. He was not a nobody fugitive. No, he was not a nobody. 
because God's eyes are always upon David. In all his crises, David could experience God. And all this crisis, crisis were refining David and molding his life. For example, in, in last chapter, chapter 19, so obviously King Saul was very jealous, but yet Jonathan trying, was trying to protect David. In verse 2, In verse 2, chapter 9, while well, my father saw six to kill you, therefore please be on your guard until morning and stay in the secret place and hide. And possibly this secret place is the stone easel. But after the conversation between, uh, between after the conversation of uh, Jonathan, then what did uh, King Saul say? And then King Saul said, I swear I will not kill David. So that's why Jonathan told uh, David that, don't worry, because my father was not about to kill you. But yeah, King Saul once again tried to cast a spear at uh, David. I'm not sure about your feeling when you end up in all this crisis. I remember that one time when I was in the U.S., I was attending the church. But suddenly there was a car passing by right in front of me. And, and then a few young people on the car were teasing at me. They were on the car, actually. Because I, I, I was so, so fearful at that moment. And then, but all those young people, at the, of, on, all these young people on the car was a te were teasing at men. So because at that time, I was so angry because I know that at that uh, crisis, in that crisis, I was nearly killed. So uh, David was in that situation as well. Because why... Uh, King Saul had been trying to cast a spear at him three times. It was not a joke at all. So for me, definitely, I was very angry in my heart. Because why? Because someone will take you at the eye saw. I saw, not eyes. I saw. And even his wife, Mika, could tell that her father was not kind to her husband. So that's why he told his, so Mika, Mika told his uh, husband, told her husband that, please let go, you have to go because someone will kill you, to, you will be killed. And the third person we mentioned yesterday was Samuel. Because, because the David got no way to flee. So finally, he went over to Samuel. So that's why Samuel also saved David. So David, I mean, Samuel asked King Saul. So Samuel also saved uh, uh, David and King Saul uh, lie on the floor and prophesied and he didn't know what he was talking about. In all these incidents, we could see that when the spirit of the Lord falls on David, it was something very true. It, it was something very true because it means that David was under God's protection. Be whatever hardship he was in, he was under God's protection. That is uh, actually, that was uh, beyond our plan. So we can have another plan B to flee for our lives. Very often, all the times I would say, uh, God will raise up some people to save us, to help us along. So today in this passage, we could see the friendship of Jonathan and David and how Jonathan saved uh, David. Verse 1 to verse 23. So by confidence... And well, that's, that is a very strong friendship, and this is a friendship of covenants. 
So this kind of friendship really cause somebody's life to help and to protect each other. Well, today is very rare. This kind of friendship is very rare. No matter how close your friends are, would he or she cut the covenant with you to uh, 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 to have us to make a solemn pact with you? I don't think so. But for Jonathan and and David, their pact was very serious and very solemn. Both of them really trust each other, and it also they cut this covenant in front of God. For example, in verse fourteen. And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die. This is what Jonathan said to David. How come David will have this kind of kindness of the Lord? And how come, how come Jonathan would trust that David will have this kind of kindness of the Lord? Because why? Because both of them were right in front of the law to cut the covenants, to make the pacts with each other. So that's why both of them could be so firm about their covenants towards each other. Would there be any other people, would there be any friends to cut the covenants with us in, in the same manner? So do you know when? Especially every time when we partake the communion together, and then Jesus always reminds us that that we have to remember the covenant that God cuts with us, that His a broken body, His a precious blood. Actually, all these things are the elements of this firm covenant, of this solemn pact, and nobody could snatch all these things away from it. Not including our sins, it not including our witnesses. Given that we are willing to partake this communion, and before we partake the communion, that we confess, that we repent of all our sins, we confess all our sins against God. Then I tell you, this communion will be very effective in our lives, and that's why we need to do this in the same manner all the times. If you were Jonathan, so it's very difficult for you. Even Michal, the daughter, could see that her father would like to kill David. But yet Jonathan still tried his all the best. He still hoped that uh, the father would not have this kind of mentality. You know, he was in a tri triangular relationship. On one hand, he needed to be loyal to his uh, father, while at the same time, he also expected David would stay faithful and loyal to his father as well. But David would find that the situation was very weird. So that's why... So finally, he looked for Jonathan, and he asked Jonathan, Hey, what have I done? How come your father would seek my life all the times? And then Jonathan responded to him like that in verse 2, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. No, he will never hide anything from me. Yeah, he was jealous of you. He would like to kill you. Yes, he would like to put you to death. But yet, Jonathan chose to say that by no means, because he still, cho he still cho uh, chose to believe his father. Or maybe what he needed to do is uh, he needed to make sure that is, that's really the real intention of his dad. But yet, deep down in his heart, he still wanted to believe that his dad was not about to kill his uh, good friends. But the scriptures this does not describe any inner feelings of Jonathan. But what we can tell is that on one hand, he also loved his father. He also wants to trust, trust his father. But David, but David, but David swear to God, make a vow before to the Lord. 
So as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. In verse 3. So when we come to the New Testament and we understand how come we should not swear by pointing to the heaven or pointing to anything to swear, because uh, this is only this is not the godly uh, vow to the Lord. Don't ever make any vow. But yet, when the situation becomes very urgent, just like the two, like the character in this scripture. Jonathan, uh, I mean David, also make a vow. So that's why Jonathan said in verse four, "Whatever you 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 your si yourself desire, I will do it for you." And also in verse five, it's talking about that in the new moon, and uh, King Saul will throw a feast. And then I will tell my father that you will be going back to Bethany. If my father was very angry and saying something very harsh against you, then I could tell that he would like to kill you. So to Jonathan, because he wanted to jump to the conclusion, he wanted to seek the affirmation, he wanted to seek some evidence, some proof to tell him that his father really got the intention to kill his good friends so that he could make the final decision. So that's why, so that's why David said to Jonathan, so if your father really got the intention to, to, to kill me, so who will be the one to, uh, to save me then? Who will be the one to tell me it? So what should I do when I'm in the safe? When I'm safe, and what am I? What should I do when I'm in the danger? Then we come to verse thirteen. I do be think that this is one of the important verses. Verse thirteen: May the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety, and the Lord be with you as He has been with my father. Do you understand the intonation of Jonathan here? So it means that Jonathan. So it, Jonathan said that. May you be with may you, uh, may the Lord be with you as He has been with my father, because it implies that He knows that the spirit of God had departed from His father, and instead the spirit of the Lord has fallen upon David already. But yet now here, Jonathan was asking David for his kindness towards him, not only to him, but also to his family, so his next generation. That he was still asking David, he's, asked, he's asking David to show him the kindness of the Lord while he still lived, as well as all his uh, a family of his houses as well. So today, so he's telling David again, please, you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So that's the content of the covenant. So it's the same for Jesus' covenant with us as well. So that's why Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. Do you see the word, the house? This is not only a covenant with David. It's talking about the covenant with the house of David. It means uh, the family uh, of David from generation of generation need to honor this covenant. So let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. So now Jonathan again calls David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he had loved his own soul. Verse 17. Have you ever seen this kind of friendship? 
Uh, but you know, some Bible commentators say that this is uh, one of the examples of homosexuality. But have you ever find all these uh, people, the so-called homosexual people, could cut the covenants like this? Does covenant really talking about uh, the protection upon the families as well? And you know, actually, a, a lot of love among the, the lovers, their love only lies in the area of lust only. And their love will not really help them, elevate them to this uh, dimension, to this extent that their love will cover all their family members as well as of one another. So, so you can see the friendship between Jonathan and David. It was so strong. It was so committed. It was so close. In verse 23, And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed the Lord be between you and me forever. So this friendship is a friendship right in front of the Lord. The Lord is the witness between Jonathan and David. So how come David could move on? It was all because of the comforts of the friendship with Jonathan. So, and Jonathan actually was a kind of angel from the Lord to David. How come he could believe uh, Jonathan? Because why? Because he could believe the God of Jonathan. So including our relationship and our friendship, everything is in the eyes of the Lord. How come our marriage vow needed to be need to be done uh, on the altar of the Lord? A lot of people will say that the I mean the marriage is only something between two persons, but I tell you no, that is not the case. Actually, the marriage is talking about our relationships, not only with each other but also with God, including all our families as well. So, verse twenty-four to forty-two, to the last verse. So in this crisis, finally, they were separated. They were separated to uh, two different ways. In verse 25, shall we take a look at it closely? Now the king sat on his seat uh, by the wall, and Jonathan was not sitting, and Jonathan, Jonathan was arising, and Abner sat by the source side, Edna saw, sat by Saul's side, verse 4. Uh, uh, sorry, verse 24. So he's the commander-in-chief. Edna was the commander-in-chief. So why, why was he sitting by King Saul? Because that was for the sense of security for King Saul. But yet David's place was empty. Uh, so David was supposedly to be in the feast uh, sitting there. But how come Jonathan was standing while well, it was out of his respect for his uh, father? So it also means that Jonathan could leave the scenario anytime, could leave the place anywhere, at any time. But on the next day, when King Saul found that David was still absent, he was very angry. So that's why he asked his son, like this, in verse 27, why was the son of Jesse not come to eat either yesterday or today? Do you think what's... Do you think King Saul knows what's been going on? How come he didn't ask Abner? of these questions, and how come he asked Saul of this question? Why? Because deep down in his heart, he knew that. Because he knew that his son Jonathan got a very, very good friendship with David. So that's why he knows something was going on between his son and David. So that's why in verse 28 onwards, and Jonathan answered King Saul with the answers that they had prepared. And in verse 30, then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. 
So he was so angry. And then he even cursed his own son. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. He was even scolding the woman of, of his son. He said, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. So, so that's why you could tell that uh, Jonathan could tell that his uh, father was very angry indeed. So now King Saul asked uh, Jonathan to go and fetch David to him. So King Saul was very, very angry. So that day, Jonathan didn't take any food. Because why? Because they could see that they, his father was insulting his best friend, and that's why he was very sad. But he didn't mention anything about uh, his uh, father's humiliation against him and against his own mother. But instead, in verse 34, he only mentioned that his father had treated David shamefully. So, and uh, this is the friendship that we could see, that we could witness between King Jonathan, uh, between Jonathan and David. Because whatever he did, he was trying to protect David. And the scriptures seldom, seldom describe the inner feeling of Jonathan. Recently, I've discovered that for the dogs, so that the dogs would not think of, it, of their own feeling. They will only think of the feeling of the master. If you keep dogs, then you know. But I believe that when the masters are not around, maybe the dogs will think a lot, will have different feelings for themselves. But, but for the cats, well, it's totally different because the cats will, can't be, will not be bothered to think about the feeling of the master. He just, he just only wants the master to, to stay with them or, or to play with them. So that's why we would say that dogs are very faithful to the master. So I would say that Jonathan was the same with David. For me, it's a kind of new discovery. So that's why I ask myself, am I just like a cat or am I just like a dog? And I find that I'm more like a cat because I'm more like a self-centered. So I really need to ask God to help me more. Ask God to change me more. So that I can put my heart more on my wife. I will not be I will not stay self, so self-centered anymore so that I can um, uh, I can please God as well as to please my wife that I need to change from the self-centeredness to be my to be God's centeredness as well as to my wife's centeredness or, or maybe to the persons who are your beloved then this is the friendship of covenant and then something happens here that King Saul, that again King Saul casts a spear at David. So Jonathan left, I mean David left right away. So in verse 41, as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, bowed on his face to the ground, and bowed down three times. And they kissed one another, and they wept together. But David more so. So here we are told that David was crying a lot. It was not because he needed to run for his life. It was all because his love for Jonathan. And he knew that he needed to go. He needed to go away. So finally, they made a solemn pact with each other. So may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So that's the friendship of this generation as well as a relationship for our next generation. We surrender all these things to the Lord. So now go in peace. 
So David arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So they departed. They departed. But before they departed, and the words of the Lord were with them. So that's why both of them trusted in each other. Both of them trusted in the in uh, each other's words. So that's why they they cut this a uh, solemn pact. So yes, it's true that maybe they they parted in the two different ways. Yet God was still with them. While at the same time, God was uh, with uh, Jonathan and David. Yet it's true there were a lot of dangers. There were a lot of dangers, a lot of things were beyond our imagination. But yet, yeah, God will still shower His grace upon them and also upon us as well. Given that we put our strong faith, our strong trust in Him, in His kindness. So shall we really praise our Lord together? Hallelujah. Yes. When the crisis come, that we need to turn to you, that we need to put all our trust in you. We trust in your kindness. We know that you are the one to lead every single step ahead of us. So that we need to run into your heart. We need to run into your shelter. Yes, Lord, when the danger comes, when the crisis comes, we need to hold on to you tightly because you are the one to support us, to, to sustain us. You are the one to protect us as well.
Jesus, thank you and praise your name. You are our stone. You are our rock. At the same time, you are our shelter and refuge. So thank you for your, thank you for being with us in our lives. And in our lives, we might have a lot of uh, troubles and difficulties and crises, but you are always with us. Lord, we give thanks to you and we praise your name. Father, we give thanks to you because of your protection and your love, and it will last forever. But yet we are only human. We are only human beings. We are only men. We still have a lot of our witnesses. When we face the troubles and hardship, we might still have a lot of a grievance and grumbling and even jealousy. So, brothers and sisters, let us put our hands on our hearts. Maybe in the past, uh, during the pandemic, or so when we face all the economic uh, a situation, we might be affected. Maybe we compare with one another. We are jealous of some other people. Let's really check our lives, examine our hearts. So somehow we might be wondering, God, how come you are so kind to him or her, but not to me? So that's why we have a lot of bitterness in our hearts. Shall we first start pray for ourselves and ask God to shine his light upon our hearts so that we can confess all our sins of uh, jealousy before the Lord so that God can really forgive us in this area. Shall we all pray for ourselves right now? We pray, we pray against this kind of uh, uh, grievance and grumbling as well as the spirit of jealousy. We ask God to forgive us. Heavenly Father, please come and help us in our lives. We have our darkness because of jealousy. So that's why we always treat the other people as, the, as our eyesore. So we always have certain kinds, certain people, and we gossip against them, we judge them. Oh, they might be our family members, they might be our colleagues, or even they might be our authority. So today, please come and help every one of us. Ask God, Lord, we pray that may you take away this kind of distressing spirit, the spirit of jealousy, the spirit of anger from us. We are always throw our temper at the other people. We are, uh, we are reluctant to forgive others. We are reluctant to stay reconciled to the others. We know that we need to treasure our relationship with people. We know that we should do so, but yet we, we fail to do it. And instead, we have a lot of grievance and instead we will be very angry so lord this morning we come before you please help us and also forgive us because because why because we have this strong spirit of jealousy and that's why our life our bones are dried up so lord holy spirit please come and fall upon us yeah, you might, even though we might not be as the same with uh, uh, King Saul, uh, we're seeking the lives of others, but yeah, we keep being angry with certain people. We keep being jealous of certain people, and this is just like the killing as well. So, Lord, we know that we need to let go of all this kind of feeling. We need to let go of all this kind of anger, judgment, jealousy. So, please come and help us. Come and help us. Yes, it's true. We have a lot of grievance. We have a lot of, of um, quarreling. We have a lot of arguing. We didn't see that God, you are our great God. We, 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 we harbor a lot of uh, bitterness and anger in our hearts, be it from our family, from uh, the working place, and even from the church, or even from the cell group. 
we have a lot of grievance against them. We have a lot of comparisons with them. We always think that how come they did not need to work hard, but they can get all the good things. So that's why we are not happy. We do not stay, uh, we, we are not contented. So that's why we are always angry. We cannot let go of all these uh, feelings. So that's why we keep all these negative feelings in our hearts. It's so hard for us. So Lord, please heal us. Please heal us. And take away this kind of uh, bitterness and anger and uh, jealousy from us. Yes, Lord, we give thanks to you. Thank you that for setting the communion. Because every time when we partake the communion, then we can change from being self-centered to be the person who fix our eyes on you because of your sacrifice on the cross, because of your giving. So because of our memory of your death, then we will not stay in our own perspective, but instead you enable us to ponder your salvation and your grace. So now I would like the co-workers to pass the communion to all of you. So when you get the communion cups, then you can stand up. So we need to change when we partake the communion. That we proclaim, we believe that. So that we believe that your communion got a healing power. That the spirit of jealousy, bitterness, so all these things are the self center, are the self centeredness. But today, that you use the life of Jonathan to remind us that that we should not that we should not stay in this situation anymore. We should not gel on this kind of self centeredness anymore. If you have partake, if you have got the communion, so you can stand up. If you do not receive one, then you can sit down so that our co-workers can pass you one as soon as possible. So if you are holding the communion right now, please pray to God right now and ask God to remove your self-centeredness right now. Yes, Lord, we are still the persons who only treasure our own thinking, treasure our own feeling. But today, I give thanks to you for your grace that once again we can meditate, we can ponder. Yeah, because the life is the sacrificial life. Yes, when we are in troubles, when we face the crisis, it's so difficult for us. 
So when we see all the other people, uh, when we face them, we are very angry with them as well, and we don't know how to see the whole thing from their perspective either. And even a dog, the dog will not ponder, will not ponder about its own feeling, and instead, the dog will always ponder upon the feelings of the owner of the master. We are just like the cats; we are very self-centered. We just enjoy doing our own things. So, but today, when we face troubles, how we, can we stay out of the troubles? Then, yes, I know that the way is we need to stay out of this、uh, self-centeredness. Today, when we observe this communion, when we partake the communion, that is not only for the sake of ourselves, but also through partaking the communion that we can meditate your sacrifice, your、um, self-denial, your love, your、uh, your、uh, forgiveness. So that we will not dwell on our problems, dwell on our needs anymore. So today, if God will shine His light upon you, so that you know in what areas that you are still sinning against God, then you better pray to God. Somehow we are still very self-centered. We do not know how to think、uh, of the others in the, in their perspective, in their shoes. Father, we give thanks to you that we can come before you to confess that we have made a lot of、uh, sins. We have,、uh, we have bitterness, jealousy, self-centeredness. We have a lot of worries. We shift all the blame to you. So, Lord, please forgive us. But this morning, we are going to partake the communion together. So, I would like every one of you to look at me to look at this bread. On the day that Jesus was betrayed, on the night that he was betrayed, and Jesus, Jesus knew that he's about to be put on the cross. Yet Jesus still remember us. He still cared about us and cared about all his disciples. He still determined to cut the covenant with us. So he held the bread and then he broke it. And he said, "And this the bread are broken for you. This is my body, I was broken for you." So Jesus Christ suffered all the slashes, all the beatings, physically. That was only because of our, because of our iniquity. He did it for us. So that's why. In the same way, Jesus blessed the cup and had prayed for the cup, and he said that this is my blood. I shed the blood for me, for all of you. So that's why today, from today onwards, you need to do it in the same way. That you you have to change. You have to change.、Uh, no longer being self self centered anymore anymore. And instead, you should face your eyes on me, because I died for you. I shed my blood for you. That Jesus Christ used His precious blood to cut this covenant with us. So, children, so from today onward, all the time you need to remember the death, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ until He comes. So today, so from the bottom of our hearts, we partake this cup and the bread, so that we realize that God has healed all our our sickness and God heals and forgiven all our sins, so that we can receive His love to stay away from the self-centeredness, because Your precious blood is very fruitful, is very effective. So let everyone of us of us partake it with the thanksgiving hearts. Yes, Lord. Again, thank you for your love. 
because your love delivered us. Yeah, we fix our eyes on you alone. That we will no longer stay self-centered. Shall we put up our hands to the Lord? Let us worship our God together. I would like to invite every one of you to follow my words to cut the covenant with God right now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your redemption. You sacrificed yourself and shed your blood for us. And you redeemed my life. So I cut my covenant with you. I will stay away from my self-centeredness. You are my centerness. You are my center. So, Lord, please help me so that me and my descendants, my descendants and I, from generation to generation, that we will follow you, that we put our trust in you. Whenever the troubles come, then when we are in the process of, uh, of the refinement, that we take away all our grievance and grumbling and jealousy, and the self-centeredness so that we can learn from Jonathan to remember all the, all the ones that we need and all their needs. Even though our, next, our previous generation has the problems, we still choose to follow you. Yes, Lord, we also learn from David. When we face all the troubles and hardship, we still put our eyes on you that we believe that all the things that you are allowed to happen in our lives are for the sake of our lives. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So please put up your hands to receive the blessings of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless every one of you, including myself, that we need to stay away from the, all our self-centeredness. In the name of Jesus Christ, I proclaim that in your lives, you have Jonathan. That you have Jonathan to be your friends, to be walking with you. Uh, at the same time, there is Jesus in your lives, in all the troubles and hardship and difficulties that Jesus will lead you and guide you. In the name of Jesus, I also bless you that you always stay connected with God and you can identify the needs of the others and you can understand the hearts of God. You can understand the needs of your families. In whatever you do, that you, you, that you will be, uh, everything will be smooth sailing and God will bless you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless every one of you.